Good morning, Hillside Church. Such a privilege to be here. So good to see you. So, most of you will know that Roger and I have been married this year for 30 years. 30 years. Seriously, guys. And one of the secrets to our very, very successful marriage is connection and deep, meaningful conversations. If you know me, you will know how important this is to me. DMCs are my thing. So to initiate one of these conversations recently, Roger asked me this question. What three questions would you like to ask God? So, question number one, was the correct Christian answer? I wouldn't have any questions for God because I would be on my face worshiping him. I mean, wouldn't we all say that, right? That is the correct Christian answer. That was answer number one. Answer number two was the cheeky banter. And God gets my sense of humor, so I'm going to ask you right now, please not to get offended on his behalf, because I believe he has a sense of humor too. So this was my answer number two to Roger's question. Okay, so God, what do you have against women? <laughs> Wait for it. So we get the periods, including the pain and the mood swings, the pregnancy, and all those gynae checks. The child, childbirth, the hormone fluctuations, and again, the mood swings. And if that's not enough, the menopause. <laughs> and let me tell you, that is no joke. And then, don't forget, there's all the mammograms. And the men, what do they get? Man <laughs> yeah, that's about it. <laughs> they get the man flu. <laughs> So, like, God, it seems a little imbalanced to me. Okay, so that's going to be the last time we laugh this preach. <laughs> you may want to get yours out too. So, obviously, question number two was a joke, and I'm not actually going to say that to God, so don't shoot me. Question number three was the real question, the one that's been burning on my heart and the one that I have asked many times, and you may have asked many times too. Question number three, God, why? Why God? Why pain and suffering? Why have some of our prayers not been answered? Why God? So most of you do know this, but for those of you that are new, I am a grade six teacher. I teach 12-year-old girls. And at the beginning of this year, I had a new girl in my class join us. She joined from a, a different school, and she wasn't actually very happy to be with us because she was very happy at her previous school, and she felt very unsure about being with us, whether she would fit in. And a few months ago, she came and shared with me that her father was very, very sick and she asked if I would pray with her for him to be healed. So we prayed many times for him. And at one point, she came to me very excited because he had sung her favorite song to her, and that for her was a sign that he was getting better. And we did celebrate together. And then, out of nowhere, he passed away. And for the first few days, she was quite stoic, and she didn't want to talk about it. She just carried on as normal. And that was actually a little concerning to me. And then about a week later, she came to me and said, Mrs. Taylor, but why? I know that he is with Jesus, and I know that he's in a better place. But what about us? What about me? Why did this hap have to happen? And in my heart, I was thinking, 
could question my angel. And last week I was chatting to Sine about this. I told her the story. And Sine lost her father not that long ago to COVID. A devastating and seamlessly senseless loss of a man, father, and husband who was so crucial to that family. I wish I could have met and known him. I'm sorry. And Sune was just saying to me, you know, the Christian community gives you the standard answer. Well, you know he's in a better place now. He's with Jesus. I mean, don't we all do that when someone passes away? We are called to bring light in dark situations. But often we fail people by not allowing them the opportunity to really grieve and to really mourn and to ask that very valid question, but why? You see, the very first step in helping a suffering person is to acknowledge that the pain is valid and worthy of a sympathetic response. And we're talking about death here, but your pain could be anything. It could be divorce. It could be racial dis I mean, relational discord. There could be many things. But now hopping back to the scene in my classroom, Mrs. Tedder, but why? And she said these exact words. She said, I'm literally crumbling inside. I'm falling apart. I can't breathe. So initially, I did not say anything. I sat her on my lap, and we both just cried together. And then the most beautiful thing happened. Of their own accord, a whole crowd of girls watched what was going on. They didn't even know what we were talking about. But they, they observed, and they came to us, and they just, they just grabbed a hold of us, and they held on tight. And for those of you that know me, you know how I love my photographs. I wish that there could have been a heavenly photograph of that to capture that moment. But that moment is etched in my heart forever. It was a moment that I knew that she knew that she belonged with us. I knew that she knew that she was deeply loved. Nobody spoke. We just loved on her. Then the very next day, I, I run a Bible class in the afternoon called Bible Fun Club, and I was sharing the message of Ruth and Boaz. And the overarching theme that I had was how the faithfulness of Ruth combined with the kindness of Boaz were critical factors in a narrative that culminated in a beautiful story of love and redemption, which were pivotal in the lineage towards Jesus. And I began telling the story, as I have done many times, and I'm sure you've heard it many times, and as you know, it starts with a family of four. Naomi, Elimelech, and their two sons, Malon and Kilion. And there is um, a famine in the land where they live, in Bethlehem, and the famine threatened to take their lives. And so as a family of four, they moved to Moab. And while in Moab, the two sons, Malon and Kilion, marry Moabite women, Ruth and Orpah. And as time passed, Elimelech, Malon, and Kilion died. And as I'm telling the story, I notice that one of the girls, a 13-year-old girl, she is weeping. Tears are rolling down her face. And I'm quite taken aback at this moment. First of all, I'm like, why is she crying? <laughs> And second of all, I'm like, why am I not crying? Because we all know, you know, I'm a crier. <laughs> why is everyone else not crying? What is actually happening in this moment? And the truth is, is that she does not know the end of the story. And the story is a lot easier to bear when you know how it ends. And I'm going to read this account exactly as it is written in the Bible. And 
Gabriel, is it you that's on words there? Gabe, is it you? Okay, so we've got slide number one. So I'm going to read from Ruth 1, verse 1 to 5. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of the two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Apathrophites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab to live there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilion died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. So it's pretty factual, pretty blunt actually, and it doesn't leave much room for the processing of emotions. However, if we read a little bit later on, we get a glimpse into what is going on in Naomi's heart. So later on, most of you will know, she offers for her two daughters, Orpah and Ruth, to go home to their original homes and their parents because they're mobile women. And Orpah takes up her offer and goes home to her family. And Ruth chooses to stay with her in one of the most beautiful and moving pieces of scripture, I believe, in the Bible. So, Gabe, it's slide number two. So this is from Ruth 1 verse 16. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from, turn my back to you, from you, sorry. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be ever it so severely, if even death separates you and me. I mean, wow, isn't that beautiful? And little did Ruth know at this point that this incredible act of unconditional love and faithfulness was actually gonna be the very thing that planted her into the lineage of Jesus. So Naomi and Ruth return to Bethlehem, and as she, re- she enters the town as in, and is greeted by the townsfolk, she tells them not to call her Naomi, because Naomi, the name, speaks of pleasantness, loveliness, and delight. She tells them to rather call her Mara, because Mara means bitter. So Gabe, can you put up slide number three? So from verse 20, it reads, Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So after reading a very factual account, we are now given just some insight into this grieving woman's heart. But despite the fact that very, very little airtime is given to her plight, we kind of get a little glimpse into what she is actually going through. All is not well with her. And I would say she is severely traumatized, bitter, angry, and I would say in modern day terms, we would say that she is in a mental health crisis and has been for many, many, many years. And yet, I don't know about you, but I'm not trapped here with Naomi or Mara. I am still filled with hope. And why? Because we know how the story ends. I know that because of an unthinkable tragedy, she became the grandmother to Obed, the great-grandmother to Jesse, the great-great-grandmother to David, and an ancestor to Jesus. 
If, however, we freeze frame the story at any point prior to Boaz entering the story, the, the picture looks like a pretty hopeless situation, doesn't it? And a little sideline revelation, Boaz's act of kindness changed everything. Kindness changes everything. And who knows, maybe your act of kindness can be the very thing to unlock destiny in somebody else's life. Never stop being kind. Let's take a, a look at another story, the story of Esther, one of my favorites. And I love calling this story, when I teach the story, a brave woman saves a nation. And it's true. And we can give the story this title because that is how it ends. But the door for the opportunity that she had to save a nation only opened up to her because of an unthinkable tragedy. Esther was an orphan raised by her cousin Mordecai. And it's speculated that Esther's father died while her mother was pregnant with her and that Esther's mother died while giving birth to her. Gabe, slide number four, please. I'm going to read the account from Esther 2, verse 7. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. Once again, we are presented with facts. There is no elaboration of the deep pain that would have been attached to this scenario. But we do always tell that story with hope because we know how that story ends. But there are many parts during the story, not just the beginning of her life, that seem pretty hopeless and terrifying and devastating, including the fact, have you processed that she was forcibly removed from her home and forced to marry a man that she did not know? But even that was a critical part in the story that pre prevented the demise of the entire Jewish nation. Some of you may have heard of a book by a man named Philip Yancey, and he's written a book called Where is God When It Hurts? It is a really beautiful and powerful read for anyone wanting to delve deeper into this topic. And one of his most well-known quotes from this book is, faith means believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. And I'm going to repeat that. Faith means believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. I wish I could tell you that life would be a walk in the park. And I have actually said this to my girls on many occasions. I wish that I could tell you that life was going to be easy and that you wouldn't have to face struggles. But in the words of Jesus himself, suffering and trouble is guaranteed. Gabe, can you put up slide number five? John 16, 33. The words of Jesus. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We will have trouble, but because of Jesus, we do have a story that finishes in hope. Without hope in Jesus Christ, our trouble has no purpose and leads to mental torment and a lifetime of pointless pain. 
I do not know how people process pain without Jesus. What is the purpose of life without hope? And hope is Jesus. But hope is something that we long for. So hope is something that requires patience. Gabe, slide number six. And Gabe, you are a superstar. I'm just, yeah, amazing. Thank you. Thanks, Sine, for putting them up there. Romans 8, verses 24 to 25. If we see what we hope for, that isn't hope. Who hopes for what they already see? But if we hope for what we don't see, we wait for it with patience. You see, and I can share some biblical wisdom with you, and you can read the whole Bible through to, to find scriptures that you need on hope and pain and suffering. But the truth is, is that I don't actually have all the answers, and there is a lot that I don't know, and there's a lot that I don't understand. And as Christians, we need to get comfortable with saying, I don't actually know I don't actually understand this. I think it is arrogance for any preacher or any Christian to say that they have all the answers and to claim that they understand it all. One day we will know it all, which is why we won't actually need to ask all the questions. Bill Johnson, in one of his famous quotes, says, if we want the peace that passes all understanding, then we give up our right to understand. Yeah. My amazing second daughter, Hannah, is busy putting together a preach that I know she's going to deliver at some point on how to navigate through the painful parts of our journey. She is a psychologist, and I know she's got a lot of thoughts about this and a lot of wisdom on this, and we've had some chats about this because it's an, it's an important part of our life to navigate our way through the painful parts of our journey because it's going to affect and has affected all of us in some form or other. We also have an amazing team in our Connection Center and Sozo Ministries where there are amazing people who are dedicated to assist people in navigating their way through their pain towards their hope and restoration, because that is where the story does end. And while there are many, many questions, and I don't have all the answers, I do know that we have a loving dad. And I do know that he is at work in each and every one of your lives. And I do know that there is a bridge between your pain and his hope. And I feel like as a church globally, that we may have failed people by not talking enough about the space in between the pain and the hope. And I kind of feel like as Hillside, we're not that bad. I think we do that quite well because I do believe that we're aware and we have put systems in place to help people navigate pain. But I believe Globally, we, we can slip into something which is now known as toxic positivity, and this is slide number seven, Gabe. And this is the definition of toxic positivity, and I don't know if any of you have heard of it. And when I first heard of it, it actually offended me because I felt like I was a, an optimistic, positive person, and somebody hinted and alluded to the fact that I might actually be a toxically positive person. I'm like... How is it possible to be toxically positive? It made no sense to me. And so I looked it up. And I actually had to repent because I realized that actually I may, I, I, I not may have, I actually was this person and I can be this person. Toxic positivity is the pressure to only display positive emotions, suppressing any negative emotions, feelings, reactions, or experiences. It invalidates human experience and can lead to trauma, isolation, and unhealthy coping mechanisms. How many times have we heard the phrases, just have faith, God is good, 
we actually, a few years ago, did a whole series on God is good. And at, during that time, it was everything, God is good, God is good. And yes, he is good. But there were some people that were not experiencing that at that moment. And we kind of invalidated what they were going through. My favorite phrase, and I use this all the time, look up, your truth lies there. And in all of our good intentions in saying these things, which are all true and we have to say them, they need to be said, but during seasons in people's lives, we may have denied them their right to grieve and to be in their mourning phase. But because I love you and because I have faith in the one who gave up his life for you, I will hold space for you. And I will stand in the gap for you between your grieving and your hope. Because I love you, I may sit in the pit with you and hold you while you are grieving, but I'm always going to lift your head and direct you to Jesus. When I'm with a grieving friend, and honestly, over the last few years, and even over the last few weeks, it has been often lately, I have to pray for wisdom to navigate this space well. And I know that I often get it wrong and that my timing has been off. We are called to preach hope and faith. Because I know that that is where your story is going to end. But we also have to have the grace and wisdom and courage, strength and endurance to navigate the in-between space well. Church... Let's get good at being real and honest with each other about our pain. Let's allow each other to grieve and mourn. If we don't, we are going to perpetuate a mental health crisis that is actually a global epidemic. Let's acknowledge our pain, but let's not live there. You do not belong there for the rest of your life. Let's not let the pain and our mourning phase define who we are. Let's trust that our story ends well because you are not defined by your pain. You are defined by Jesus Christ and the hope that is inside of you through him. Gabe, slide number eight. Last Sunday night... Jilly preached the most amazing preach on Psalm 23, and I'm going to read it. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest of valleys... I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What a beautiful psalm, and it ends well. But along the way, there is an enemy, and there is also the darkest of days. Psalm 30, verse 11 and 12 is a scripture that I quote often to friends who find themselves in the darkest of valleys. I actually quote it probably the most to encourage friends, and it goes like this. You've turned my mourning into dancing. You've removed my sackcloth, and you've clothed me with joy. It is a beautiful, beautiful scripture. And yes, there will be joy. And I believe it for each and every single one of you. No matter what it is that you are facing right now, I believe that there will be joy. 
But in order for that scripture to be valid, that joy comes after a period of mourning, which is why there was sackcloth that need, needed to be removed. But it doesn't end with the mourning. It ends with the joy, and so will your story. If we look back through the Bible, we see countless stories of people who faced impossible circumstances. And it was in these very hopeless situations that God did his very best work. Moses stood in front of a Red Sea with an army of Egyptians behind him. The Israelites stood before a wall. Joseph was sold as a slave by his own brothers and then imprisoned for something he did not do, forgotten about. David stood in front of Goliath. Daniel faced a lion. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in a fire. Jonah was inside a whale. Jesus was crucified and put in a tomb. If we freeze frame any of those stories at that moment, they seem like hopeless stories, but God was at work, and every single one of those stories culminates in a beautiful miracle. In the words of John Jorgensen, only God can turn a mess into a miracle. Only God can turn a trial into a triumph, a test into a testimony, a victim into a victory. His power is made perfect in our weakness. So in order to see his perfect power, we might need to embrace our perfect weakness, moments and seasons of weakness. So, to sum up my theology on suffering, I've got a quote from Philip Yancey, but I just want to say that there are people out there who will say that God causes us to suffer, to test us. I do not believe that at all. But I do believe that he is at work in your suffering because I do believe that what the enemy plans to destroy you, God will use that very thing to bring about an amazing miracle. So Gabe, can you put up my last slide? And you've been a champion, Gabriel. <laughs> I love this. This really just sums up what I believe. As we rely on God and trust his spirit to mold us in his image, true hope takes shape within us, a hope that does not disappoint we can literally become better persons because of suffering. Pain, however meaningless it is, it may seem at the time, can be transformed. Where is God when it hurts? He is in us, not in the things that hurt. He is helping to transform bad into good. We can safely say that God can bring good out of evil we cannot say that God brings about evil in hopes of producing good. 